it's finally here. UFC 300 has arrived, and boy, do we have a stacked card for you this Saturday night. In the main event, Alex Pereira defends his light heavyweight strap against former 205 champ Jamal Hill. In the co main event, it's an all China showdown as reigning strawweight queen Zhang Wei Li goes to battle against number one contender Yan Xiaonan. And that's not all, the BMF belt is back. This time, Justin Gaethje looks to defend his crown and the man stepping up, Max Holloway. UFC 300 goes down this Saturday on TNT Sports 1 and Discovery Plus with the prelims from one and the main card from three. Welcome to Fight Week on TNT Sports and Discovery Plus. This is your official preview for UFC 300. Sounds good, that, doesn't it? I'm Adam Catterall, pleasure to be in your company and a pleasure to be in the company of these two. Big cheesy grins, look at them, excited <laughs> about getting stuck into this card. It is, of course, the one and only Mr Nick Pete and the Hall of Famer himself, Mr Michael Bispin. Mike. <sighs> Sweet Mother Mary and the holy donkey of Bethlehem, my friend, because this is one hell of a card. Oh, it really is. I mean, listen, for some reason, there's been a lot of chatter online, people criticizing and things like that. It's insane. This might be, and I'm not just saying this as a company man, right? This might be one of the greatest fight cards that we've ever seen. A ridiculous amount of champions. They're all competitive fights. Top to bottom, right from the very first prelim of the night, we've got two former champions fighting. You don't want to miss a single fight on this event. Yes, it's one of the best. Yes, UFC 299 was amazing. Guess what? If you've got a problem, you're just spoiled as a mixed martial arts fan. The UFC are delivering the goods time after time, and UFC 300 will go down as one of the greatest events that ever took place. Just to prove that point, I'm going to ask Nick Pete the same question about four or five times throughout the course of this show. Nick, what's going to be fight of the night? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I talk about always ask a big question. I'm going to go with, right now, and I might change later, as you say, I'm going to go with Oliveira versus Tsarukian. How about that? Right. Only just made but, it onto the main card. That's how insane know, this fight is. I do believe that Justin Gagey versus Max Holloway for the BMF title, <laughs> uh, Nick. I mean, that, that, that could take it. Right, right. listen. So, the, so the whole cool. point of asking that... Cody Garbrandt Figueredo. In right, the game stop, right, stop. Of the night. That's the point. That's the point of the question, right? Because I'll ask you again in about five minutes, Nick, and I've no doubt you'll come up with a different answer, mate, because that is how stacked this card is. Top to bottom, it is an absolute banger. We are starting with the main event, though. The light heavyweight title is on the line. Alex Pereira, what a rise he's had in the UFC in such a short period of time, coming out of kickboxing into MMA. Two-weight world champion already, and he's taking on the former champ, the man that's been out for a long period of time with his injury, Jamal Hill, looking to get the strap back, Mike. What a fight. This is going to be phenomenal. Listen, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Jamal Hill yesterday for my podcast. He has got a chip on his shoulder because he, he kind of feels that people are dismissing him as a threat to, uh, to Alex Pereira. Jamal Hill, let's be honest, this man can bang. And he's, other than that one loss to Paul Craig where he got caught in a, an arm bar, uh, other than that, the man's undefeated. Look at the knockout of Johnny Walker, the way that he flatlined him. The power that he has is phenomenal. Granted, it's not as polished as, as Alex Pereira, but he's still very effective. Now, on the flip side, Alex Pereira is beating four former or current UFC champions, a two-weight division champion in the UFC already. The things he's doing is phenomenal. He fights nothing but the best. It seems that almost every one of his fights in the UFC has been against a champion. I mean, this man has stood up to the challenge every single time, right? He's one of the biggest stars in the organization, one of the most exciting fighters that we've got, and there's a very good reason why this man is top of the bill. These two, when they go at each other, I don't think we're going to see too much wrestling, but we are going to see violence, and that is guaranteed. Nick, how impressed have you been with Alex Pereira, the way that he has transitioned from kickboxing into MMA, two-weight world champion in such a short period of time? It's ridiculous. Two years, in a two-year span inside the UFC. He's become a two-weight world champion. It's absolutely frightening. And when you look at his career as well, you know, he was 15 years in fight sports. He's 36 years of age. That means he didn't start fighting until he was 21, 22. It was the first time he ever did any kind of martial arts. He's a phenom athlete. What he's done is absolutely insane. And as Mike just said, it's not only what he's done in a short space of time, it's the caliber of opponents that he's gone through as well. You know, former champion Sean Strickland, former champion Adesanya, 
former champion Yeri Prahachka. They're just those last three wins. Absolutely insanity. But he's only been here for a minute, but then so has Jamal Hill. He's like kind of only been here for a minute as well. These guys are both big, tall, strong, stand-up strikers. They both believe in their power. And let's not forget, this light heavyweight belt, how many times has this changed hands since mm. John Jones left the division? It's a hot potato, and I wouldn't put money on it changing hands again on Saturday night. That's an interesting narrative, isn't it, Mike? Because when Jamal Hill did relinquish this belt, after it was previously relinquished by uh, Jury Pahachka, both guys obviously suffering injuries, Alex Pereira wasn't a problem at 205. He was with the 185 guys. Yeah. The whole divisional landscape has changed quite a lot since Jamal's been out. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what's so great about it, to be honest. I mean, listen, we love a long-term champion like an Israel Adesanya at middleweight when he was the champ, of course. But this adds a lot of excitement. Now, Jamal won the belt from Glover Teixeira, beat him down over five rounds in Rio. Uh, and it was a sensational performance. Sadly, injuries happened. He tore his Achilles tendon. So he relinquished the belt. He allowed the division to move along, uh, which you've got to respect. But now he's coming back for what he truly feels is his. So he doesn't look at Pereira as this big knockout artist he says yeah maybe he was knocking people out at middleweight but he's not doing it at light heavyweight granted he did just knock out Yuri Prohaska <laughs> to become the champion so I don't know how much research Jamal is doing okay because the threat is real but that's what I love about Jamal, right? He's not allowing himself to be intimidated. I think uh, in private, of course, he understands the threat. He's doing his homework. He's watching the tape. But also, he's not putting him on a pedestal. He's saying, listen, this is just another human being. I've knocked out plenty of people before. People like Thiago Santos, Johnny Walker, as I said, beat down Glover to share it over five rounds. A man that is really, really technical, that's got great takedowns and all the rest of it. But as I said, takedowns aren't going to come into this one. Both men are going to stand in the middle of the octagon and throw down somebody will be getting knocked out. Listen, what a great main event. Light heavyweight title is on the line. I'm not going to ask the guys to pick because it is just a sensational fight. Mike did flag up, though. Tom Aspinall's name there. And just a quick one before we move on to the co-main event. We've got a brand spanking new show for you on Discovery Plus, exclusive to Discovery Plus. Make sure you go and check it out. Tom Aspinall's Fight Lab. And in there, he breaks down the main event and various other fights in UFC 300. Loads of fun, loads of chat, loads of bits of banter, but also bits of education as well from the current interim heavyweight champion. And whilst I'm on it, make sure you do have the D Discovery Plus app because if you miss one of these fights, I don't know, you might be chatting to your pals or something like that and you might want to watch one of these fights back from the weekend in the early hours of Sunday morning, then you can do it via the Discovery Plus app where you've got intricate markers for individual fights. You can fast forward, rewind, all that carry on. It is the place for the UFC. Now then, let's get into the core men because we have got Jing Wei Li taking on Yan Xiao Nine. It is two girls from the same country, bragging rights there, but also a sensational fight in this division, Mike. Jing Wei Li, for a lot of people, is the best female fighter on the planet right now, but Yan Xiao Nan, in the last couple of fights especially, has absolutely punched her ticket for a shot at the title. Yeah, without question. Last time we saw Yan Zhao Nan, and the reason that she's in this position is because she beat former champion Jessica Andrade, and she did it in a performance where she looked the best she's ever looked. She was crisp, she was powerful, she was accurate. Jessica Andrade is known for coming forward in a marauding style and swinging haymakers. Yan Zhao Nan was on the back foot looking for the openings, jabbing to the body, bringing the hands down. When she threw low kicks, they were fast, they were sharp, they were powerful. And the right hand that she knocked her out with, Yan Zhao Nan stepped back, saw the opening, boom! Placed it perfectly, knocked her out, and that's why she's in this position. Now, she's going to need all of that accuracy because Zhang Wei Li, this woman, is a force of nature. Ever since she came to the UFC, she's done incredible things. The first ever Chinese champion on a three-fight win streak against Amanda Lemos just battered her from pillar to post, okay? Before that, took out former champion, um, Carla Esparza, dominated that fight, and then won before that against Joanna Yon Jacek, okay? The strawweight queen, spinning back fist, Ooh. fake planted Joanna Yon Jacek, a vision, a, a sight that no one ever thought they'd see. Joanna Yon Jacek knocked out cold face first on the canvas. That went down in Singapore, and that's just kind of a taste of what she can deliver. Zhang Wei Li's phenomenal. Let's remember the first fight with Yuan and Jacek, where them yeah. two went Fighting to war yeah. for five rounds, okay? Just unbelievable stuff. All Chinese affair. I'm very excited for this one. From a Wei Li point of view, 
Nick, how impressed have you been with her development? Because she's kind of grown up a little bit within the UFC, hasn't, hasn't she? At the start, maybe there was deficiencies in her game. She's gone away, worked incredibly hard. We saw her obviously come up short against Rose. But wow, man, what we've seen over the last couple of fights from her, she really has excelled. She's, as you say, she's blossomed before our eyes, but you can see where the work is as well. You know, you see a lot. Over in the US, a lot in Las Vegas. She spends an mm. awful lot of time at the PI in Las Vegas. You know, she's she's really put the work in and the fruits of her labor can be seen before everybody. You know, she for me, she's the best female fighter on the planet today, pound for pound, number one. Uh, performances absolutely proved that. Yes, there's a glitch in there, and her name's Rose Namajunas. And sometimes even the greatest fighters, the greatest champions, just have someone that's their kryptonite. And maybe Rose Namajunas will forever be Zhang Wiley's kryptonite. But anybody not called Rose, Rose Namajunas is in serious trouble against her. She is so aggressive. She was so strong. Her ground game has absolutely caught up with her attacking, striking style as well. We're talking about a career mixed martial artist right here. But why, why this fight is so intriguing is that she's facing Yao Nan, who's got a similar age, similar record, also a career mixed martial artist, a girl that's really found some real hot form in the UFC right now. Mike Munchens, uh, the knockout last time out. That was her first knockout in the UFC. Of all the people to do it against, Jessica Andrade, that punched her tickets. But you know what? Form guides, who's the best? Who's the number one pound for pound? Who's the number one contender? All that also goes out the window because it's Derby Day, kids. And there's more on the line here than just the belts. There's Chinese bragging rights forever and a day. So four means nothing. We're going to see something quite special in this co-main event. Listen, it's all set to be an absolute cracking co-main event. Make sure you're locked in on TNT Sports and Discovery+. Plus. And if that's not enough, if you want another fight that could possibly go 25 minutes, and I'm actually backing that it will, given the toughness of the two guys that are actually in this fight, we are talking about the BMF title being on the line for Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. Just let's take a breath, lads. Just take, just take a breath and dream that in. The silhouettes, all the violence, it's all going to be here. And you're all going to enjoy it on TNT Sports. Mike, what a fight, mate. This is ridiculous. Ah. I mean, it's fantastic. It really is. Justin Gaethje, the human highlight reel. I mean, what a perfect nickname for this guy. The last time we saw him, the shocking head kick knockout over Dustin Poirier. Of course, before that fight, Rafael Fazeev oh. uh, pushed back. One of the best strikers we've seen in the UFC. Beat him at his own game on the feet. Didn't deviate from the way that he always fights. Didn't use the wrestling credentials that he has. No, stood there, went toe-to-toe -to -toe and was the better guy. On the flip side, Max Holloway. Legendary chin. Never been finished. Never been knocked out. If I'm not mistaken, never been knocked down which is phenomenal. Now, granted, that legendary chin, that will be put to the test. For Max Holloway, it's annoying because Volkanovski came along and he lost three fights to Volkanovski, okay? So what does he do? He says, right, okay, well, I've got to take another challenges. And he took on Arnold Allen, took on the Korean zombie. And now he's taking on Justin Gagey. I mean, this man is a natural born fighter because also he said, and I really respect him, he said, I knew if Taporia beats Volkanovski, they're probably going to do an immediate rematch. So what am I going to do? Wait on the sidelines? No, I want to stay active and I want to test myself. And the people at 45, I've beat them all other than Volkanovski and Taporia. So I'm going to go up to 155. I'm going to take on one of the most dangerous, the knockout man, the human highlight reel, just engaging for the BMF title at UFC 300. I mean, come on, Max Holloway, take a bow. Absolutely. Listen, Max has done this before. He has stepped up to 155. He fell short against Dustin Poirier, Nick. But it was on kind of last-minute notice. He was stepping mm -hmm. in as a replacement. He's had a little bit more time to get used to this psychologically, used to this physically as well. <sighs> Could he stay at 155 if he's successful here? Do you anticipate him coming back down at 145? What's the path for Max now? Uh, listen, he's Max Holloway, so he can kind of do whatever he wants because, you know, his Hall of Fame jacket's already taped up, measured, and sitting in a wardrobe somewhere in Las Vegas waiting for him whenever he's ready to finish. You know, he made his debut at 18, was in the UFC at 20 at the time, was the youngest ever fighter in the UFC when he made his debut um, at that period of time, I mean. 
And since then, it's been nothing short of remarkable. Yes, there's been a few losses on there, but it's kind of been to the same guys. Dustin Poirier a couple of times, Conor McGregor one time, Volkanovski three times. But when does Max Holloway not come back and consistently put in outstanding performances? Most fights in the featherweight division, most wins in the featherweight division. For me, arguably still the greatest featherweight body of work of all time. There's absolutely a, a, a statement to be made there for sure. But he's far from done. And I think this BMF belt is perfectly suited for him. Yes, Justin Gaethje is an absolute monster. You know, two failed title attempts. And what does he do last year? Goes and runs through for Zeeb. Goes and knocks out Dustin Poirier. There's plenty left to come from Justin Gaethje as well. Let's be honest. This is a main event on any other mm. planet, in any other event, any other country, any other promotion, you name it. This is a main event that people buy tickets and fly across nations to sit ringside for. And this is third on. That's how good this card is. It's ridiculous. <sighs> right, we're three fights in. Nick, what's uh, your fight of the night? <laughs> God. I'm going to go with that one now, aren't I? Okay. Because I'm, all right. oh, that's all I'm thinking about is just absolute <laughs> mayhem between Gaethje and Holloway. Speed versus precision versus don't stand in front of him, but please just stand in front of him and fight in a phone box. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be mental. Cool. So there you go. Okay, that's going to change in about another three or four fights. So make sure you stick around for that. With that being said, it's probably going to change after this fight. Charles Oliveira is fighting Armin Sarukian. Again, another fight in the lightweight division. Big ramifications of both of those fights because you want to make a statement, you want to be shooting towards Islam Makachev. Charles Oliveira, been there, done it, got the T-shirt, taking on a guy that on debut ran Islam Makachev very, very close. Armin Sarukian, definitely improved. Mike, just talk me through this because it looks like mayhem. Well, it does, because that's what Charles Oliveira brings to the table. He just walks people down. He does not care about the threat coming back at him. He has amazing tie boxing, vicious knees, elbows, good punches, knockout power. He's vicious. He's a terminator. He goes in there with one objective, to go straight forward and finish you with his world-class jiu-jitsu. He's got the most bonuses. He's got the most finishes. He's got the most submissions because he's got one speed. I'm coming for you, buddy. Simple as that. <laughs> I don't care about strategy. I'm not picking my shots. I'm not using head movement and angles. I'm walking forward like a chainsaw, like a buzzsaw. I'll take the shots and I'll get the finish. And that's why he's so dangerous. But he's also been a little bit reckless. And when he lost mm -hmm. to Islam Makachev, that's because he didn't employ a little bit of strategy. Now, you think he would have learned something from that Ooh. fight and then change up his style when he fought Benil Dariush? No, straight back to it. <laughs> didn't care. Walk forward, bish, bash, bosh. But he got the job done. He beat yeah. down uh, Benil Dariush. And Dariush was on quite the win streak back then. So, on the flip side, Armand Sarukian, a man that probably technically can match Oliveira. Jiu-jitsu-wise, I would say so. Wrestling-wise, I'd say he's probably better. better. And on the feet, he looks beautiful. I mean, the way Saul Rukin finished Dariush, that mm. was beautiful. And that was the signature performance. He's always set his stall very high. Always said, I'm here to be the champion. Made his debut against Islam Makachev on very short notice and still Ooh. to a decision. And he wants to get his hands on Islam once again. This fight is going to be ridiculous. You've got Saul Rukian brimming with confidence, dropping people with flying knees who can wrestle all day long. And we've got the Brazilian Terminator with every record under the sun on his belt. You know what I mean? How does this not take fight of the night? Oh, he's got it. He's changed it. He's ah, gone. I, I love it. I have it. <laughs> not to that. <laughs> it's an MMA fan's dream, isn't it, isn't it, Nick, this? Because both guys are just so attacking... When you attack and attack and attack and attack, gaps do appear and they're so yeah. good at taking advantage of those gaps. Yeah, it, it would. Uh, Mike mentioned it then, the word reckless. It's easy to call them both reckless, but when they're both so destructive and they've got so many wins and so many finishes and so many standout performances on their record, Charles especially, is it really reckless or is it just incredible fighting that you're pushing forward, putting the guy on the back foot? Both these guys can make mistakes, but sometimes they thrive in those mistakes because yeah. it, it creates other openings. Crazy things happen and they both scramble like absolute lunatics. They both throw hands and feet like absolute lunatics. They both got submissions for days. 
I love Charles Oliveira, and over the last few years, you know, mine and many other people, he's become, Charlie Olives has become our favourite fighter in the UFC because of the journey that he came on from the favelas, told he wouldn't even be able to walk, found jiu-jitsu into the UFC, losses and wins everywhere, and then suddenly finds lightning in a bottle and becomes incredible finishing machine and UFC champion. But I've got a feeling about Armin Sarukian. To me, feels like the lightweight version of Ilya Tapora. And we've just seen what Ilya Tapora's done at the weight division below, became champion, end the reign of Volkanovski. I feel like Sarukian is on a very similar path, you know? And I, I just feel like this could be the moment in time where he steps forward and then the narrative with Islam, as you both pointed out, lost to Islam on his debut. Fight of the night bonus for both, though. That's how good a fight it was. Yeah. Likewise, Gamrot, the other loss on his record, that was a fight tonight as well. Could have gone either way. This kid's quality. I believe one day he will be lightweight champion. And if he beats Charles Oliveira, that day might come soon. That is why these two gentlemen are on this show, right? Because I, I'm, I'm pretty confident somebody watching this has just stumbled across us. Whatever channel you're flicking through, you think he was on the telly. Who are these three talking? What are they talking about here? You've just listened to them two talk about that for the last five minutes. Are you going, when is this happening? I I need to see that fact. What is it that they're talking about? I need to see it. Well, let me tell you. One o'clock prelims, three o'clock main card. Make sure you come and join us on TNT Sports 1 for UFC 300. We've not finished yet. We're not finished. I, I won't ask the question just yet because Bo Nickel, a guy that the UFC are well and truly behind. Mike has got a wonderful opportunity to kind of announce himself as the next generation of star here, taking on Cody Bumbridge. Yeah, look, listen, Bo Nickel, this man is a generational talent when it comes to wrestling. Wrestling is one of the most technical and competitive sports in America and all over the world. The level that, that you have to be to get the success that he has it's, it's game-changing, okay? The discipline, the uh, technical ability, the strength, the discipline, the kind of training sessions that you have to endure. And this man has done all of that stuff. He's come over to mixed martial arts. He's undefeated. He's finishing everybody very, very quickly. And when you speak to him, he's very, he's not cocky. He's not arrogant, but he just knows what he's capable of. Mm. And that's why I took a second there to explain how hard it is to kind of get to where he has got in wrestling. And that's why he's so confident. And that's why people are talking about him being a champion already. Now, of course, you've got to step up in competition. Every time he's fought so far, he's finished it. Last time out, it was Val Woodburn, got the job done with the hands before he got, got it done via submission against Jamie Pickett. Now he's fighting Cody Brundage, who can wrestle, who is coming off a couple of good wins. A slam last time out, picked his opponent up, slammed him on the ground, dazed him, and then finished him with the hands, right? So he's a strong guy, and the guy can wrestle as well. So it's a good logical progression. It's a good step up. For Cody Brundage, this is a good chance for him to say, you know, prove everybody wrong, to have a chip on his shoulder, say, listen, I know what's going on here. You've brought me in as the next person to lose for Bo Nickel to step up, to give him a big platform, the opening fight on the pay-per-view at UFC 300, so he's an overnight sensation and everybody knows his name. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to mess up that narrative. I'm going to rock the apple car. I'm going to beat him. And I'll tell you what, Cody Brundage has the potential to do that. Bo Nickel's only human, and with the right mm -hmm. kind of strategy, you never know. He could pull off the upset. There you go. Um, on to the prelims. Gentlemen, this is ridiculous, this card. <laughs> <Stop saying laughs> because, it. Yeah, because we've gone through the main card and every single one of them's a banger. And then you've got this. Back to the light heavyweights. Of course, we've got the light heavyweight title on the line. And we've got Yuri Prohachka taking on Alexander Rakic uh, as the featured prelim at UFC 300. Mike, of course, Yuri Prohachka licking his wounds off the back of the defeat in the title fight to Alex Pereira. We've got Alexander Rakic, who's had a bit of a topsy-turvy time, but the penny seems to have dropped with him. Yeah. A massive, massive fight. And if Rakic in particular can make a statement here, he might be next in line for the 205 title. And this is one of my picks for fight of the night. I'm it telling is. You, I'm not trying to be funny. I think this one's going under the radar. Yuri Prohashka, the man's a maniac. I just said yep. before he's got an unorthodox style, but he knocks out a lot of people and he's got a tremendous chin. He's got good grappling as well. Okay, that fight with Glover Teixeira in Singapore, I mean, that was just, it was mental. It was bonkers, whatever you want to call it. It was five rounds of mayhem until he got the guillotine right at the end. Um, 
Alexander Rakic on the flip side hasn't got quite the profile. He hasn't become the champion, but he's got the possibility of doing that. He's been out for almost two years now. He was fighting Jan Blachowicz, a former champion. He was probably winning the fight as well, and then he blew his knee out, tore his ACL. He's had uh, surgery to repair that. But before that, he's beaten the likes of Anthony Smith, Thiago Santos, a very, very big light heavyweight as well heavy kicks, his leg kicks are so strong and so powerful, he's massive for the division, he's a big hitter, and it's two guys that don't like each other either. Uh, Rakic is from Austria, Yuri Prohashka is from the Czech Republic, right? or Rakic, is, he claims Serbia as well, but Austria is where he lives, and he says that Yuri has been talking a lot of smack about Austria, so there's a little bit of politics, European politics going on here, they don't like each other, simple as that. Uh, Rakic came on my podcast, was like, when you speak to Yuri Prohashka, ask him about this, ask him about that, I'm not going to repeat it here because it's not... It's 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 explosive. It's nasty stuff, okay? <laughs> so these two don't like each other, and there's a potential title fight for the winner mm -hmm. of this. Let's remember that. Stakes are high. Yeah. Also, from our point of view, it's always I'm always intrigued, Nick, of seeing how somebody bounces back from a defeat. And Yuri Prohachka obviously is that fighter coming off the back of the defeat to Alex Pereira. How does he react in this monster fight? Well, let's not forget, prior to the loss to Alex Perheya, he was unbeaten for eight years. You know, he was on a 13 fight win and run all the way into the UFC. He's only had four fights in the UFC, which is insane when you look at his record. He's, he's fought kind of a who's who all over Europe and a few other continents before he even got to the UFC. And when he arrived here, he looked like he was going to be top of the tree for a long time after he beat Glover Teixeira, became the champion. We were like, wow, we've got this crazy Eastern, Eastern European Tong Po type character that looks like he's going to be the poster boy this weight division forever. But then he picks up the injury. Then he has to give the belt up. And when he does come back, it's on the back of an 18-month layoff. I don't care who you are, how talented you are. 18 months out of the octagon does not bode well coming straight back into a five-round title fight with, every, with anybody. Um, but then on the flip side of that, Rakic is kind of in a similar boat now. Let's not Rakic, when he came into the UFC, by the way, looked like the future of the division. And then he had a couple of losses, and suddenly Yeri Prata came in, stepped straight in front of him. Rakic will feel like, wait a minute, you stole my crown a little bit there. You stole my momentum. And he'll want to take that back. But again, he's coming in this time after that knee surgery. He was supposed to rematch Jan at the start of the year. That fight didn't happen. Instead, he gets Yeri. I think UFC got wind of the fact. Bit of needle here. They don't like each other. This is what final eliminators are supposed to look like. Number two in the world. Number five in the world. Let's slow down. Let's cause murder. And I'll tell you what, the main event, the title fight's in the main event. So whoever wins, make sure you call out whoever's got the belt at the end of the night. Let's continue, shall we? Because we have got Calvin Cater taking on Aljamain Sterling. Uh, Aljamain Sterling stepping up in weight, Mike. Uh, obviously, former champion. Uh, down at 135, and now he's up at 145. Be interesting to see how he fills out that frame against one of the best strikers in this division. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it's a big question. Calvin Cate has been, a, you know, one of the top guys at 145 pounds for a long time now. You know, kind of uh, an unofficial gatekeeper. He hasn't fought for the belt, but he's one of the top guys. He's highly ranked. So for Aljamain Sterling, this is a big splash. He's dipping his toes in, taking on a ranked guy. And if he can beat him, well, if you listen to Aljo, he says that he should fight for the belt next. I don't know about that, but it's certainly going to be a tough test. Now, uh, 135 pounds, Aljamain defended the belt more than anybody. So he's, he yeah. was very successful but he was knocked out by Sean O'Malley again I'm not taking away from O'Malley O'Malley is phenomenal that fight against Cheeto was tremendous in every way but you got to wonder about the weight cuts for Aljamain Sterling because people always talked about him they would look at him and go this guy's gigantic and it's kind of yeah. like Alex Pereira at 185 okay you cut weight it affects your ability to take a shot so now he's gone up to 145 after doing legendary things at 135 Calvin Cater welcome him to the division can Kelvin Cater keep this fight on the feet? Because guess what? He's tall. He's long. He's got great straight shots. He uses that jab. He's got a mean right hand as well. Kind of like Sean O'Malley. Okay, so we're going to find out. Because one thing is for sure. Calvin Cater will test the chin. Is it a case of Aljamain Sterling not really having the best chin? Or was it the weight cut? That answer, that question, sorry, will be answered. Because Cater will connect. Simple as that. Listen, we've got seasoned vets on USC 300. We've got champions, former champions. We've got ranked fighters. And we've also got some young bucks coming through. Nick, Sadiq Yusuf, Diego Lopez. Super Sadiq has been 
you know, gradually just ticking along in the division. But Diego Lopez burst onto the scene, showed great attitude, and now he's getting his reward fighting a ranked fighter on such a big card. Yeah, he's been around for a long time, as Lopez. You know, the, the Brazilian based out of Mexico and trains at Globo MMA, but he's really come into the UFC and become nothing sort of a sensation in the space of just one year. 2023 mm. is when he arrived. Took a late notice fight against uh, Evil Web. Lost it on points, but really put in a good fight. And then bounced back at the end of the year with two first round finishes. Absolutely phenomenal stuff. It's a great fight with. To the Yusef, to the Hukes, a very talented fighter himself. His only losses, I think, with Arnold Allen and Edson Barbosa. So he's only losing to the top ranked guys. This is a real step up for Lopez, Diego Lopez. But I think Yusef, I think it's the right fight at the right time. But Lopez is hot, and there's nothing better than getting a hot fighter and snatching that fame away from him. So I love this one. Speaking of world champions in action at UFC uh, 300, or former world champion, should I say, Holly Holmes on the card. Great to see her. And she's welcoming a UFC newbie, a person that has made it outside of the UFC, double Olympic champion, a champion with another franchise. Kayla Harrison finally makes her decision to come to the UFC and challenge Holly Holm. Mike, on this fight, is the big debate early doors about Kayla hitting the weight because she's used to fighting at 155 in MMA? Mm -hmm. That is correct. And she's gigantic, let me tell you. I sat next to her at a fight at Madison Square Garden, right? She she was jacked, okay? Yeah. I put my hand on her shoulder. I was like, my word, she's a big, big lady. She's a lifelong athlete, incredibly talented, not only big and strong, but a tremendous athlete, an Olympic level caliber athlete, a, a champion in other organizations. The judo is phenomenal. Uh, and she's coming over now to make some waves in the UFC and truly be known as one of the best martial artists. Yes, it's all well and good being a champion outside of other organizations, but we all want to be UFC champ. That's the one that really matters. And she's going up against Holly Holm, who has been there, who's done it, who's got the T-shirt, who has been the champion. And this is a clash of styles. Kayla Harrison is a grappler, first and foremost. Likes to take you down, get on top, control, submit, ground and pound. Holly Holm, we know. She's in the Women's Boxing Hall of Fame. She's a former champion. She head kicked Ronda Rousey into oblivion. Can she keep the fight on the feet and use the length? Can Kayla Harris take it down and have a successful UFC debut? Can Holly Holm turn back the clock at 42 years old as well? So there's a lot of narratives coming into this one. Can uh, Kayla Harris make weight at yes. 135? Fighting at 55, there's a featherweight division. She's coming at bantamweight because she wants to stardom. So there's a lot of questions here. It's an intriguing matchup. First of all, welcome to the UFC, Kayla Harrison, and all the best to both ladies in the fight. Right, as I said at the start of the show, we've got a special guest to come and join us for UFC 300 preview here on TNT Sports. And we're taking full ownership of this. You may have seen at the back end of last year, we were all there speaking to Dana about UFC 300, about what fights he was going to make. He wasn't giving anything away, but we made a request. On behalf of all the fans that watch this sport, you have to put Jim Miller on this card. He's been calling for it. We've been calling for it. He was on 100. He was on 200. He has to be the star of the show at 300. And the prayers have been answered. And here he is. Jim, great to see you. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Doing well. Thanks for having me on. When did you get the call? When, when, when did the stars align for you? And did they make a bit? They must have made a ceremony out of it, mate. They must have gone full, <laughs> on, full, full party mode because of what uh, you've done previously. I, I, I must have missed the parade. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I, I found out probably a couple of days after my fight, uh, January 13th, uh, that, uh, yeah, I was getting a fight on, uh, on 300 and, you know, it's a, it's, it's been a long time coming. I've been asking to fight on that card for a long time. My goals kind of have changed a little bit, you know, uh, originally it was like, Hey, let me just get to 300 and we'll call it quits on a big card. Um, but here I am coming into it, you know, five and one in my last six, all five of those wins are, are finishes. Uh, feeling good and and uh, you know I, I've got the opportunity to uh, sneak my way back into the rankings again you know after a, after a decade out so uh, yeah it's uh, uh, pretty pretty awesome whatever you are doing Jim you're doing something right because you're about to take on <laughs> a ranked opponent so mm -hmm. 10 years on you're about to be ranked again if successful Saturday night talk to me about Bobby Green as the opponent a fantastic opponent one that's really mm -hmm. got fight fans on the edge of their seat, but to be 
in the sport for so long, holds so many records, and on the cusp of being ranked again, you know, forget about 300. We could be talking title shots next year, baby. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know, Bobby's a, a, a very interesting fight, right? You know, he's, he's got an interesting style. I mean, we, we, we tried to have this fight in 2014. This is a decade in the making, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and then there were two other times in 2021 and 2022 that uh, we tried to fight and, and, and things came up. Um, so, you know, crossing my fingers, you know, hopefully uh, everything works out. Right. And, and we get there and, and we get to step into the octagon together. Like I said, I, I, I try to train to, to optimize myself. I feel like I've kind of kind of got it figured out. I, I uh, like I, I know what I need to do, you know, and, and like I've I've got that I've got that list of priorities when it comes to training camp. It's like being healthy is number one, like mm-hmm. not not aggravating the, the old injuries, not getting new injuries. Uh, which is hard. <laughs> it's pretty exhausting, but uh, yeah, like that's that's my that's my number one thing. And then being in shape, it's like yeah, I know that if I'm in shape and I'm not dealing with injuries, I'm a I'm a dangerous guy. And then it's like, all right, be sharp, be a little prepared for what my opponent brings. And uh, yeah, like I I, I I think I I think I kind of figured it out being the old man in the in the division and 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 uh, how I need to go in there and, and approach this. Now, now, Jim, let's talk about the serious stuff here, right? Introductions. Now, sadly, we can't say the word on TNT Sports. <laughs> We're not allowed to throw the profanity no. around. But, but we know what requests you put in uh, yeah. to, Mr., to Mr. Buffer. Yeah. W- what's the current situation? Because Nick's got a great idea of if we can't get uh-huh. Buffer to do it, we've got a great idea maybe of, of being able for it to still happen when your I'll name is it. called out, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bisfit will do it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You know, uh, it, yeah, we're going to, we're going to be live on ESPN. Uh, so the, the issue is that they don't, they don't want to bleep Buffer. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, the thing of it is, right. It's like, it's not, the, the the nickname came about, you know, years ago. Joe Silva gave it to me uh, because I just accepted fights. You know, it's like, hey, do you want to fight Dustin Poirier? And it was midnight and I got back to him in, you know, a few minutes. And he's like, of course you do because you're Jim F and Miller, you know, like so. Uh, it's it's like the Catalina wine mixer, right? That's it's it's not just the Catalina wine mixer. It's the <laughs> effort Catalina wine mixer and everybody knows it that way. So, you know, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love it to still happen. Maybe the stars will align. Things will, things will go about, but yeah, if, if, uh, if the crowd has to do it, if, if, you know, Bruce has to pause and let everybody in the, in the arena, do it, have, have biz being up there. You know, I got the count screaming it like uh, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, you know, and, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll take the fine, uh, myself and, and say it in the post fight, uh, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, uh, uh, we're still, we're still working on it. We're still working on it. Now, Jim, I've got one final serious question and I want you to just take a deep breath for a second here. By my calculations, I reckon UFC 400 is going to be around <laughs> 2030. Now, that would put you at 46. Listen, Holly's fighting this weekend with you. She's 44. Mm-hmm. Randy Ford at 47. Orlovsky's still going at 45. Jim Miller at 46, UFC 400? No. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. I, 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 I said it in an interview just this week. If I'm leading up to my 50th UFC fight, I want you guys to know that, that that's it. Like, if I get there, that's it. You take, cut the gloves off me and take them and run, right? Like, don't let me sign a, another bad agreement. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been fun. But, yeah, <laughs> hopefully I get to 50 fights in the UFC, get to 30 wins in the UFC, and then we can call it a wrap. Mate, mind blowing numbers. Listen, Incredible. Jim, firstly, congratulations. Enjoy the week, man. We are so Thank looking you. forward to being on the ground for UFC 300 and seeing you do your thing once again against Bobby Green. It's going to be one heck of a fight. Thank you so much for your time, Jim. All the best. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate you guys. All the best, Jim. Thanks. Um, you, lads, check this out. Um, we've run out of time. We've run out of time. 
so we can't speak about Cody Garbrand and Davidson <laughs> Figueredo. That's how stacked this card is. We've run out of airtime and we're missing one of the best fights. Two former world champions taking each other on the first fight of the night. That is fight going to be... That's my something. fight of the night right there. <laughs> that is going to be something special, let me tell you. Uh, listen, with all that well uh, said and done, it's been an absolute pleasure previewing UFC 300. Hopefully you're as excited for it as we are. Don't forget, it all goes down in the early hours of Sunday morning on TNT Sports 1 and Discovery Plus. Make sure you come and join us. You can check out Jim Miller and Bobby Green on Fight Pass and then come and join us for the prelims from 1am in the morning and that main card gets underway from three, all culminating with the light heavyweight championship of the world as Alex Pereira takes on Jamal Hill. It's going to be a cracker. <laughs>